Hey, good morning. I, I, I love that. You just mention the name Deepak Chopra and you get a laugh. So, <laughs> a good way to start the talk. Deepak, I'm, I don't mean it. <laughs> All right. Um, there we go. So, I want to thank you for coming out this early uh, and hope you have plenty of coffee. And I would also like to invite you to do a little work before we do the play. So what I'm going to do is experiment on you a little bit. If you don't mind, this is totally voluntary and it will be totally anonymous, so um, don't worry about it. And to start, I'm going to divide the room into two sides, two groups, group one and group two. So uh, the rules are please don't talk and you'll be reading uh, what's on the uh, screen and writing down uh, the answers to a couple simple questions. So first, group two, please turn away from the screen if you wish to participate. Since you're skeptics, I will assume you're intellectually honest. <laughs> okay, group one, please read this quietly to yourselves and uh, write down the answer to that question at the bottom. Okay, now, please write down the answer to this question. Now, uh, group one, please turn away from the screen, and group two, please turn toward the screen. Please write down the answer to this question. Okay. Now, please write down the answer to this question. Okay, now you can all look forward again, thank you. One other, one other quick activity. Please study these words. I'll, I'll even help you by reading them to you. Candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good, taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, cake, Eat pie. Okay, is there another test coming? Hmm, yeah, all right. Don't write anything, just think. Think back to the, to the list and to, to me reading it and just think of all the words you can recall, okay? Here's three words. Uh, it could be that none of these were on the list. It could be that all of them were on the list or that one or two of them were on the list. So what I would like you to write down is which of these words you are confident was on the list. If you can actually picture in your mind the list and see the word or imagine that hearing me that I had read the word and you're confident that you remember it, write it down. Don't guess. So of these three, which, if any, were on the list? Okay. Just realize, by the way, Write the number one at the top of the next card and circle it if you were in group one, and write the number two on the top and circle it if you were in group two. <laughs> oh, oh darn, we can't go back in time, can we? Okay, so anyway, presumably they will keep them separate, but I, that would have been nice, huh? All right. I'm here to talk today about forgetfulness, no, uh, subliminal, how your unconscious mind rules your behavior. And obviously a little birdie was telling me that we didn't want to keep these groups separate. Okay. So let's start with what is unconscious behavior. So unconscious behavior has several hallmark traits. One of them is that it's effortless. So it's something that your mind does for you. That's a great gift. It's, it's automatic. It's also done outside of your awareness. So you don't know that you're doing it. And it's also a thought processes that are generally beyond your control or your conscious control. So they're, they're, they're automatic, beyond your control, and outside of your awareness. As a result, we don't really understand what's, influence, what's influencing us. We make decisions, we have feelings, we have thoughts, perceptions that we think we're in charge of, but are really greatly influenced by things that we're not in charge of. And before I start, I want to contrast this with the Freudian unconscious, that what scientists sometimes call the new unconscious is far different from the Freudian unconscious. The Freudian unconscious was something that was hidden from you for motivational reasons. And that could be revealed through therapy or introspection. 
And the new unconscious is not like that, and it's thought to be hidden from you because of the structure of the brain and the way the brain operates. So my book is based on a new field called social neuroscience. The first meeting of social neuroscience was in, I think, 2002. And it's a, a field that grew out of uh, the, the marriage of three fields, or the menage a trois of social psychology, which is a psychology of how we interact. And I'll, it's a theme that I'll talk about repeatedly today, which is that humans are social, social species. And as we evolved, our cooperation and our interaction was very important. Many scientists think that uh, the, the extra intelligence we have compared to other animals was developed for this purpose, for, for our social interactions. It certainly wasn't for physics. We didn't need physics to survive in the wild. Uh, so uh, this is a very important field, social psychology. Another field was cognitive psychology, which is the psychology of how we think. And prior to the 1990s, we really had no way of connecting these behavioral studies with what's going on in the brain because we couldn't look in the brain. Although some scientists in the 19th century did actually look in uh, animals' brains, cut open the skull and, and, and watch the brains as they, uh, as they uh, stimulated the animals. But this is something that uh, eventually became frowned upon, fortunately. <laughs> but today we can, we can do that using something called uh, fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is like the usual MRI that, that doctors use to look at your organs, except it has the F in front of it for functional. What it does is it, it, it only, not only gives you a a picture of the structure of the brain, but also if you look at these hot spots of, of what, what areas are active. So this allowed scientists starting about only about 10 or 15 years ago to do what they tried in the 19th century, which is to look inside the skull and watch the brain working. And that has uh, been a great boon to, to neuroscience and caused a huge explosion in activity in the field, but also been a, a revolutionary thing in psychology because now psychologists can connect the brain to the behavior. This is just one example that I, that I really like. Uh, this was an experiment done in Berkeley. And what the scientists did, this is, illustrates very nicely the power of fMRI. Scientists showed subjects a series of slides. There were, I, I don't remember, but there are many slides. I'm just showing you four of them, images like this, while they were laying in an fMRI machine. So they were imaging their brains, and they're taking, the scientists are taking electromagnetic recordings um, of their brains. And then the scientists had a computer which, which interpreted the electromagnetic recordings and tried to guess what picture they were looking at. And they had a, a database of six million uh, images to match from. And let's see how, what a good job that the, the, the machine could do without any scientist's input, without any knowledge of what the actual pictures were that people were looking at. This is what the computer guessed. So I, I think that's pretty amazing. Not only uh, the, the layout, uh, and the uh, types of objects, but even the theme seemed to be correct. They didn't guess that the snake was a twig with a similar shape, for instance. So uh, th this just shows you how, um, you know, how impressive fMRI can be. And uh, luckily, however, people have to be laying in the machine <laughs> to do this, so they can't just walk by and take a snapshot of what you're thinking. And since you're the skeptics, I'll give you one other little technical footnote that I don't usually talk about. Th that. This is so far, this technology is statistical, which means that they didn't, th th this reconstruction was not done just on an individual person, but on a series of many people. And, and, and by looking at the, the data from many people, the computer was able to, to get these pictures. Uh, it wasn't, they, they didn't get those reproductions on a one by one basis. But the technology is ever advancing, and this is just an illustration of, of the, the potential for it. So today, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about the unconscious in, in, in two respects. One is perception, physical perception, mainly audio perception and vision. And then I'm going to talk about the social unconscious, which is, I think, the more interesting uh, part of the, of the field. But I want to talk about vision and hearing first because, first of all, because a lot of the processes that go on in his vision and hearing, the way that your, your unconscious mind processes the data, have their analogs in social perception. And, and the illustrations and visions and hearing are obviously very visual and, and, uh, and very vivid even in the audio uh, realm. So it, they give good illustrations of, of what's going on. And then we'll see how very similar or very analogous processes go on in social perception. So 
the point is that our perception and our social judgments, and I'll also talk a little bit later about also our memory, are all constructions. They're not accurate, they're, they're not literal reflections of the data that your brain takes in, but they are constructions that, by your brain, by your imagination, by your unconscious processing, that use that data and use other things to give you what seems to be a clear picture of reality, but really is an artificial constructed picture of reality. So the rest of the talk will be about illustrating that in many realms. And you'll see that not only do we employ the actual data that comes in, but we employ context, expectation, and even our own personal desires and our prior beliefs, which is how we can get fooled sometimes. The way we experience the world is largely driven by this unconscious processing. This is an image of what your, of the data that your act, uh, a literal image made from the data that your retina would actually perceive a, when, looking, when you look at a certain scene. This is some, a roadside scene in Canada. And let me show you what it would look like if you just took the data on your retina and literally transformed it into a picture. Okay, this is what your eye picks up. Uh, this, is, this, this area here was made yellow just to show, hmm. <clears throat> Now that is spooky. This area here was made yellow just to show uh, where your eye is fixating, and this here is a blind spot from where your optic nerve attaches to the retina. And what you'll see is that it's pretty clear here, and it gets fuzzier as we go away from the center. Now what your unconscious mind does, fortunately, without you having to think about it or to um, expend any conscious effort, is it turns this into this. So your unconscious mind takes this fuzzy data, fills in the blanks, sharpens it, and gives you what you perceive as a real and clear picture. In fact, a three-dimensional picture, even though the data there is really two-dimensional. So your brain, uh, your brain fills in the missing data. All right. Uh, this slide illustrates how your brain, first of all, how it's automatic and you don't have control over it, and also how your brain uses context to fill in the, the data. When you look at this picture, you'll see those squares A and B, and you perceive B as a white square and A as a dark square, and that B is lighter than A. But I want to tell you right now that actually B and A are the same, the same colors exactly. And the reason that you perceive them differently, this is a gift of your brain, because if you were just a physics instrument that took in the raw data and had to do a calculation every time to come out with the conclusion that A is a white square, and, and only, uh, only appears the same, is, is the same optical data, that B is a white square and it is made from the same optical data as A because of the shadow of the cylinder and using the, the squares next to it and all that context and, and, and to make a conclusion like that, that would be very effortful and take a lot of time and you'd probably be eaten by a lion or fall off a cliff while you were doing these kinds of calculations. So it's a gift of your unconscious mind to do that for you. Let me show you what happens, though, when we take the context away and your brain will do a different calculation. So now you see, you can see clearly that A and B are the same. Whereas on the right side, you can see that B looks much different. So this is, illustrates another great tool in your brain, which is face processing. As I said before, we're a very social species and being able to recognize who is who uh, even outside of the election uh, of elections is, is a very important thing. Uh, if humans are not only a very cooperative species, but also a very violent species. And you really have to know who's your friend, who's your enemy, who can you trust. You have to know what people are thinking. And uh, so your brain has a specialized region that, that processes faces. The, the nice thing about this demonstration is that that specialized region is, is focused on on identifying faces in the context that you normally see them, which is right side up. And it doesn't work that well when the faces are upside down. So when you look at these two, they both look pretty much like President Obama. But now let's turn them over. So when you turn them over now, you can see that, that uh, the one on your right isn't really President Obama. It's a very grotesque version, the Republican version of President Obama. <laughs> So now let, let's look at the automaticity here. I'm going to turn them over again, and I want you to look at them, and, and now I want you to try and see them as remaining grotesque. 
So you can kind of see, if you focus on it, that things are a little bit weird about the one who's now on your left, but it doesn't look grotesque the way it did when it was right side up. This is because all this is going on in your mind and you don't really have any control over it. There we come back. So this was all, this was all taking place in vision, but I want to show you that, that in other modalities, similar processes occur. So let's do a demonstration from, from hearing. Again, I, my point is going to be that your hearing, what you hear and what you perceive is not directly what's out there, but the product of unconscious processing in your brain. So I'm going to play you a, a song that you may, may recognize. So that's a, a little bit of a Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. And the question I'm going to present you with is, was Led Zeppelin smart enough and devious enough to write a song that makes sense when played forward and also when played backward? Now, some of you may be familiar with this, and I want to thank Michael Shermer. Where is Michael? Is he here? There he is. Hey there. For the, the backwards audio and words, this, and, and, and Michael spends his time as a skeptic debunking people who claim that there are these automatic, that there are these hidden messages, but I want to talk about the automaticity of this. Okay, I want you to listen to it. I'm going to play it to you, for you in reverse now, and so I want you to listen carefully, and I want to see if you could write down, if I asked you to, uh, the words now for the backwards song. All right, now if you haven't heard this before, I don't know if some of you have, but, but uh, it, it sounds like gibberish. And you don't really make any sense of it. There might be something that sounds like a word here and there, but it's pretty much gibberish, right? That's, that's one way of listening to it. Now I'm gonna, just like I showed you the two squares uh, on the checkerboard, it looked different with context and without context. I wanna give you a little context. So I'm gonna play this song again, backwards, with the words. So just follow along on the screen and listen and see if, if you don't really hear those words, okay? So now you heard the words, right? So I, I, I've given you two, two physics, uh, two identical physics versions of reality, and your and your perception had two very different uh, uh, human perceptions of reality. And the question is, is which is real? Well. Let's play it again now. Let, let's see if you can. Let's let's see if um, you can get over this context, just like I, I did with the checkerboard, and I asked you to look at the checkerboard and, and try and see. Now that I told you that the squares were different, to try and see them as being different. I want. I'm going to play this again. I want you to follow along, with the words, but not hear them. Okay. So I want you to overcome your unconscious processing that makes you uh, match the words with the sound, but I want you to hear gibberish just like the first time. So now, you, now that you see the words and you hear it, you can't go back, you can't go back the other way because you don't have control over this. Your mind is really helping you. The purpose of the unconscious mind is to fill in the reality, to, to make it easier for you to react to things 
in a, in a very fast, smooth fashion in the things that happen in your environment. It can be fooled sometimes, but th those are the exceptions, the optical illusions, the audio illusions, and those will soon seen also the social illusions that happen. But sometimes you can be fooled, and that's why people can put on the internet, uh, there's many songs like this on the internet, and speeches by, by that horrible defig disfigured Obama uh, that, that are played, people claim played backwards uh, have uh, subliminal messages. And if they, when they show people the words and, and, and you play it, it really sounds like the message is there. And you can understand why people would believe that it's really there because it seems very real to you. But it's just a construction of your unconscious mind based on the context that they provide for you. And you can take any words that have some, within some neighborhood of, of, of the sound, of the real sound, and you can plug them in there and you'll think those are the words. So finally, I'm gonna play it one more time quickly without the words, without anything, but I, I, my guess is you're spoiled now and you're gonna hear the words anyway because they're kind of burnt in as they are with me. So I've given you a couple of illustrations in vision and hearing. Let's, let's move on now to the social unconscious. All right. So our social perception is also not a direct result of what we experience, but just as, as you saw in hearing and vision, you take in data about other people, about social situations, about businesses, and you form a picture that's based on that data, but also on other things such as context, uh, as again I said, your beliefs, your desires, and you form a picture, uh, a more complete picture of that person or that situation than you really have the, the right to but more importantly, that picture seems real and, and, and people will not believe when they do experiments, when, people, when we do experiments on people, they don't believe that this is not real. They really believe that the picture they're seeing is reality, which is just, just as you do uh, with your vision and your hearing. So for instance, I'm gonna take this off now because I'm hot, but I, I put this on to, because subliminally, I want you to think I know what I'm talking about. And a jacket, uh, at least in New York City, makes you look that way. Now I look like an amateur, so I have a harder time convincing you, but I'll take my chances. So one of the things that we, uh, kinds of data that we take in about people is appearance. I'm going to talk about physical appearance here, but we take in a lot more data than purely a person's physical appearance. We take in uh, their emotions. We look at their body language. We look at their, uh, their expressions. We, um, we, we judge what they're thinking and what their intentions are by a lot more than what they say, but also by how they look. And this slide has to do with pure physical appearance, like wearing a jacket, for instance. Scientists at the University of California at Irvine gathered hundreds of people together, or I mean, brought hundreds of people into their lab and had them analyze photos of women, face shots of women, and, from, and they asked them whether the women looked competent. They, had to, they asked them to judge how competent they looked. And they used that data to figure out what it is about a woman's face that makes that person look competent. So I'm not talking about beauty here, but competence. Uh, for instance, a slight widow's peak was judged to, be, to make a person look more competent, a little smile, and they had a whole list of, of, of factors. Then they hired two female models and a photographer and a Hollywood makeup artist to create two pictures of each model. One picture was designed based on their study to make the person look more competent and the other to make the person look incompetent. Not grossly incompetent, but just more incompetent looking. And then they brought other subjects into the lab and they told them they're doing a study on elections and they wanted to know how people would vote if they didn't have advertising but just had the same kind of data on both candidates of elections. And they told people that they were gonna show them flyers based on real candidates in congressional elections that were outside of their district so they wouldn't recognize the people. And they wanted them to read the flyers and determine how they're gonna vote. The difference is that half the people were shown uh, uh, flyers that had headshot of the Democrat looking competent whereas the Republican looked incompetent and the other half it was vice versa. Everything else in the flyer was identical. 
So the people who were reading the flyers were, were believing that they were judging people based on that data that was in the flyer, which was their education, their, their um, background, their views. But the experimenters wanted to know if they were also judging them based on the photos. So these are not the, the actual photos. I, I, they weren't in the paper, so I just, these are just representing the, the, uh, the two cases. So let's look at how the Democrat fared against the Republican in the two cases. The first one on your, on your left is where the Republican looks more competent and the Democrats looks less competent. So the Republican won 58 to 42. So we know that a lot of people always vote for Republican or always vote for a Democrat, but there are swing voters. And the question is, how much of a swing is there when everything is identical except the appearance? So let's see. So now the Democrat wins 56 to 44. So the difference there is 14 points. The Democrat got, did 14 points better when she looked more competent. The Republican did 14 points better when she looked more competent. So this study seems to, to suggest that when we make our decisions for something even as important as voting, we are voting on the person's looks as well as the issues. If you ask voters that, they will generally deny it. But let's look at what happens in the real world because this was just, if you're skeptics, you, you, you're going, well, this was just in the laboratory. Does this really happen in the real world? So a professor at Princeton tested this in the real world. He gathered before the 2006 elections pairs of headshots of the Democrat and the Republican in uh, candidates in hundreds of elections uh, from around the country, gubernatorial, senatorial, congressional elections. And he brought subjects into the lab and flashed these pairs of photos in front of them and just and these people didn't know what they were looking at, and if they, were, they were told that if they recognized any, then they should not vote on that pair. But they were told to look at the pair and just quickly to say left, right, which one looks more competent. So he gathered in this way data on which of the candidates in all these elections looked more competent, and then he predicted, based purely on the looks of competence, who would win the election. So nothing to do with party, incumbency, views, just looks. The question is, obviously, if, if, if look of competence had no effect, it would, he would have been right 50% of the time. But how often was he right? Next. 70% of the time. So 70% of the elections, the person who looks more competent wins the election. I, next, I want to talk about another way that we take in data about people, and that's through touch. All primates, touch is very important for all primates. As you can see here, I, I have four different species of primates pictured. The, the other than the one in the center, which is a little more subtle, the other ones spend hours a day grooming each other. They pick dirt and insects out of each other's hair. And they can accomplish that in just minutes a day, 10, 20 minutes a day, but they spend a lot longer than that because among primates, touch is used to form uh, trust, uh, to bond, and to uh, form social structures. Now, in the center there, you see uh, some humans forming bonding in the same fashion, but it, with humans, it's, it's really a lot more subtle, and yet it's far more important and has far more impact than we realize. In fact, scientists have discovered certain kind of uh, specialized nerves in your face and in and your um, upper torso that seem to be designed just to transmit the pleasant feeling of touch. They, they are a kind of nerve that doesn't transmit the feeling quickly enough or, or specifically enough to be very useful for determining what's touching you exactly, but, but, but just stimulates oxytocin release in your brain. So I want to tell you about a couple of experiments uh, about this that, that illustrate the effect on people. My favorite one was done in France, so you can guess it had to do with either wine or romance. And in this case, it was romance. Uh, they, well, and it's holding the wine, but actually what they did was they hired actors, two actors, handsome young actors to stand on a street corner in a town in northern France on a sunny afternoon over several days and to proposition all the single young women who walked by. What a job, huh? <laughs> if you're a guy, at least. But... Um, they were all told to, to say exactly the same thing. This is the script translated. So they all propositioned the women exactly the same way, except half the women, they gave a, a very light half-second touch on the shoulder or the elbow, and to the other half, they didn't. 
And the question was, how would this affect their success rate? And the answer is, it doubled it from 10% to 20%. Now, of course, this is, a, uh, this is a experiment that was done directly uh, in an area where you think touch might be important. So let's look at some other areas where, where we might be more surprised by this result. For instance, in restaurants, there have been several studies where waiters and servers in restaurants were told, were asked to touch half of their, of their customers and not the other half as they were interacting with them. Again, not a grope, just a very light, quick touch. And in, in exit interviews, when people afterwards were asked, most of them didn't even remember the, the touch, and, and they claimed that they were not influenced by it, if they did remember it. So what is, how did that affect the tips in restaurants? 14.5% versus 17%. So they, they got considerably more tips when, when, they, when the waiter or waitress touched them. So also 50% uh, more took the waiter's suggestion, or the waitress's suggestion, uh, to order the special when she included, or he included, a touch. Similarly, the cooperation, uh, 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 you know, if you've ever been asked in a mall, if you want to spend five minutes taking a survey and you're busy and you don't want to do it, well, if they touch you, you're much more likely to agree. Okay, so finally I'm going to talk about uh, one other thing called motivated reasoning. One of the things that your unconscious mind does for you that's very important is it gives you a very strong sense of self and it makes you much more optimistic about the future and gives you courage to face daunting obstacles. So life was very hard, or at least at times was very hard thousands or tens of thousands of years ago when humans lived in the wild and we needed something to help us have the courage to overcome the obstacles of nature. Today we still have many obstacles. You could get, for instance, uh, you'd be starting up a new business or you having to go through a course of chemotherapy for cancer or many other very um, daunting challenges await us. And human beings have a natural optimism, a natural misjudgment of their own chances of, of, of succeeding. And that's what I want to talk about now. And that's called motivated reasoning. And just like your judgments of people that take into account voice or looks, or touch and are influenced by them, our view of ourselves and of other issues, issues that have to do with us is greatly influenced by these unconscious processes of motivated reasoning. What motivated, when you're making a decision or when you're making a perception of yourself or deciding a political issue, let's say, what do you do? You take in data about it. You take in, you know, your data about yourself. How did I do this? How did I do that? What does this person say about me? Or, you know, what are my accomplishments? What's my education? Or if it's a, if a political issue, you take in data about does a death penalty work? Does it deter crime and all the different things that the media tells you? And you weigh all that and you come to a decision. But because of motivated reasoning, we don't weigh that in the way that a scientist would weigh it, which is, or scientists should weigh it, I should say, uh, which is to take in the data objectively, see where it seems to point, and, and draw that conclusion. Instead, we tend to act more like an attorney, where we know where we want to go, and we look for a way to get there. So what this means is that when data comes in, we do a few things to it. One is that we, we have to judge its credibility, right? Well, we tend to poke holes and judge as less credible data that opposes what we want to believe. Another thing we have to decide is how much weight to give different kinds of data. There could be uh, one piece of data that says uh, you're a great speaker, and there might be another piece of data that says no one really likes to hear you talk. And when you're looking at where that data comes from, you have to decide how important is that, how how much weight to give that piece of data versus the other piece. And one thing we do is we give more data, to, more weight to data that tends to point to the conclusions that we want to reach. Now, it's very important to realize that we don't do this consciously. You don't say to yourself, this data is pointing to where I want to reach. I'm going to weigh it very strongly or I'm going to discount, I'm going to poke holes in that data. This is stuff that you really sincerely believe that your unconscious mind makes you feel that way about it. And you don't, just as in the other areas of perception and, and in hearing, you're not aware that it's going on. It happens automatically and it, and, and, and it seems very real to you, the results of, of your unconscious processes. So this is a good illustration of that from a uh, study in Texas. 
In, in this illustration, in this study, subjects were given data on a civil court case in which a motorcyclist had an accident with a mo automobile driver. It was a real case and it was settled for somewhere, or it wasn't settled, the judge awarded somewhere between zero and $100,000 to the plaintiff. So the subjects in this uh, trial, in, the, in this experiment, were given the transcripts of the court case and pictures and all kinds of data from, from the actual case. And they were told, half of them were told that they would, in a mock trial, be representing the, the plaintiff, the motorcyclist. And the other half were told that in this mock trial, they were going to be representing uh, the automobile driver, the defendant. So they read through the data, studied it, and prepared for this trial. But then before the trial, the, the researcher said, wait a minute, I'm gonna give you a chance to make 50 bucks if you can guess within $5,000, between zero and 100,000, what the judge actually awarded. So now the, the people were asked to look at this data that they had analyzed with a certain motivation because they were representing one person or the other and be objective about it. You know, it was, after all, it, it was just a game anyway. It wasn't, they weren't really lawyers, so they should just take off their, their advocate's hat and look at the data objectively. The question was, could they do it? Could they look at, even when they had, they had $50 at stake, could they take off their hat and look at it objectively? Just like, could you listen to uh, Stairway to Heaven backwards now that you've seen the words and not hear the words? Well, let's see what happened. So the people who had been assigned to represent the plaintiff, the motorcyclist, guessed on average that a fair award, award would have been $40,000 to the plaintiff. The plaintiff, the motorcyclist, okay, the one who got injured. Okay, so now let's see what the people who had been told they were going to represent the defendant guessed would be a fair, uh, a fair settlement. $20,000, half. So those who, even in this very artificial context, were asked to analyze the data with, with a certain uh, slant in mind, couldn't help but see reality with that slant, even though they all looked at the same data. So this is very important when we think about, uh, you know, why, why do people believe things differently than we do, believe different things? We look at certain things and say they're absurd. They look at certain things and they believe those things that we think are absurd. And you know, we sometimes tend to think they couldn't be sincere, that, uh, that the person of the other political party couldn't really believe what they're, say, you know, what they're saying. They're just saying that to get elected, or they're just saying that because they're, if they're going around saying pseudoscientific things, they are charlatan or whatever. But you can really believe that because of motivated reasoning. People can look at the same data and see very different things. Oh, so. One result of that, which will, I hope bring this home to you, is this, 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 these are statistical uh, analyses that show how motivated reasoning changes our own view of ourselves. So the first, in the first study, high school kids were asked, are you above average? <laughs> now, if you know any high school kids, you can guess what the answer was. This was a study of three million high school kids, okay? So rounding to the nearest percent, how many do you think said they were above average? 100%. <laughs> so there you go. Now, as someone who's done some teaching, although I hope I, I look a little more sophisticated than this guy, even without the jacket, um, how, how many college professors do you think believe that their research is above average? After all, they all know, presumably, if they get to be a college professor, it, that, that only 50% of research is above average. How many, how many college professors think their research is above average? 94%. So there are only 6% who go, yeah, yeah, 50% have to be below average, and that must include me. <laughs> um, this can be a little bit dangerous in medicine and in business if you, if you have this overconfidence. Uh, doctors, for instance, in one study were asked to um, analyze a, a bunch of cases to see if, whether they were pneumonia, and then they were asked how confident they were in their diagnoses. So there, there was, had, turned out to be a, a little bit of a gap there. They, they were 80% confident, 88% uh, confident in their diagnosis, but they were only right 20% of the time. So you have to be careful. And in, in business, this is very important too, because um, when companies make acquisitions, the person who's running the company that's doing the acquiring tends to say, I'm, I'm a much better manager and CEO 
than that person running that other company. Once I get that company, it's going to just take off because that person isn't as good as me. And so what do they do? They overpay for companies. On average, about 41%, they pay on average about 41% over the target firm's price, but the combined value of the merger usually falls. So that's a little something sobering, but it's maybe dangerous to say here in, in New York City. Um, f finally, I, I'm going to uh, show you one other aspect of motivated reasoning, again with students, but this is a whole other, um, a whole other mechanism that's going on, and that, that is I talked about how you change the way you weigh data and you change the credibility you assign to data based on what you want to believe, but you also change your memory of things. You, you, people have a selective memory. You tend to remember much longer and more vividly good things and to not remember bad things. So in this study, seniors in college were gathered together and asked to name their grades in all their courses they took in high school. And they signed over their transcripts. So the researchers had their transcripts and they knew that the researchers knew what the re real results were. So there was no motivation to lie. But the question is, uh, did they remember their A's equally well as their B's, C's, and D's? And you can see a very nice progression from, I think, about 90% A's and um, I don't remember, 80% B's, 70% C's, etc. 89% A's, 64% B's, they remembered 51% of their C's and only 29% of their D's. So that's why I always tell my students, if you're not happy with your grades, just wait a few years, they'll get better. <laughs> okay, let's get to you. Because, you know, when I give these talks, sometimes people think, actually, there's a study, a study on motivated, this is an interesting study on motivated reasoning, that people say, yeah, yeah, I know that that, that affects people, but that affects other people, not me. <laughs> So I want to show that these things can affect you. And this, you're a pretty sophisticated crowd. So let's see if, if, uh, what, what happened uh, with these tests that I gave you. The first one I asked you, how much would you expect to pay for this hotel room? So this is a few of the groups I've given it to before. Uh, group one, here, here's their, what they said they expected to pay. It's usually about in the 1,000, 1,500, something like that, 1,200. Um, and now, group two, on the other hand, guesses about two or three hundred. The question is, was I powerful enough to subliminally influence you guys to make this huge mistake? Well, it's, it's not necessarily a mistake, because I'll tell you later what the room really costs, but at least one of you guys, one of you groups was wrong, right? And could I, like, hocus-pocus you into, into, into taking in the same data and making a different judgment, okay? And... Uh, the answer is yes, because uh, group one uh, guessed on average, and this was calculated by a theoretical physicist, so it's got to be right, it was $1,821. Group two, $268. <laughs> All right, so I'll tell you what, I'll, I'm going to show you what the difference was, but I, I want, how many of you have heard of anchoring? Okay. So here's a group that's very sophisticated and knows that this happens and fell for it anyway. The difference was that in, in the first question, you were, it was different for the two of you. Group one was asked, does this hotel room cost more than $5,500 a night? Group two was asked, does this hotel room cost more than $55 a night? And I guess it was probably most of you said, obviously it's not $5,500 and obviously it's more than $55 and it's like a throwaway question. It's like when you watch late night TV, you can't sleep, they want to sell you a bunch of knives and they say, how much did you pay for these? $700? Well, just for you today, it's $7. And you go, well, that's so ridiculous. You know, why, why would they, I, of course I wouldn't pay $700 for that set of knives. But $7, what a bargain. It's probably worth $500. I don't know. So, so, so they, they know what they're doing there because they're, they're changing your, your whole context. And it's the context, just as it was with the checkerboard and as it was with the uh, backward music, that changes. And, and, and it's your perception, your social perception of your environment changes based on the context. Well, finally, let's talk about the other experiment. I've, I've talked about how you fill in data in, in vision and hearing and in social environments, and it also happens in memory. Your memory is not as scientists and psychologists used to believe is not like a video recording. 
It, you know, it, it, people used to think that it was, your memory is like a video recording, and when you forget, it's because it's getting fuzz, you know, it's getting corrupted, so the recording starts to fade like it's a, the second, third generation copy, fourth generation copy. And that's not what happens at all. What really happens, if you were, um, know anything about computer graphics or how you make, make um, c compress uh, movies on a computer, is that you have, you remember certain key frames. Your, your mind remembers a certain key moments and, and the gist in general of, of, of what the memory was. And then when you call up the memory, it fills in the difference. It, it, it takes that, those little highlights that it remembers and it creates often, what's often a very detailed picture and always, or also often, a very clear picture of what happened. And just like your, your, your retina took in the, that fuzzy uh, roadside scene and made the clear picture, your memory also seems clear. And this can be very dangerous when eyewitness testimony is relied upon to convict somebody. You know, if there's other physical evidence or if the person knew the, the perpetrator, that's different. But if, if, if a stranger did something to you and there's not a lot of other evidence and the person's convicted on the eyewitness, it's very dangerous. And now with the Innocence Project and the advent of DNA testing, a lot of uh, people are being released from prison. But in, in Subliminal, in the book, I talk about one very sad case where a woman was, was raped and had the presence of mind to study the rapist's face during the rape. And afterwards, the police showed her a, a photo lineup of, I, I forget, six or eight uh, possibilities. She's going in with a certain context. What's the context? The context is the police think that the guy's in there, right? He's one of them. What does she see? She sees the general features of one of them matches what she studied. She was a little hesitant at first, but she picked the guy out. And subsequently, when she was asked to pick him out again and again, because uh, there are other many stages to this, she gave, became more and more certain of her initial identification. The, the memory became e very clear. But all that, that was there in her memory was the, the gist of the guy's face. And this was a guy who looked something like the real perpetrator, but was innocent. And he, uh, while he, he, he was convicted, sent to prison, after many years in prison, the real rapist was also happened to be in prison for something else, confessed to a, another inmate. There was a new trial. In the new trial, they put the two of them side by side. The judge says, who did it? She points to the original guy again. He goes back to prison with an even longer sentence this time. And he ended up spending about 17 years in prison, and then the OJ trial came, and DNA testing became popular, and they managed to get the uh, rape kit tested, proved that the, um, that the guy who had confessed was indeed the, the rapist, and it was a very tragic case. And they, together, the person who was wrongly convicted and the woman ended up writing a book about it. So let's see if you were fooled in, in this simple uh, memory test that we did today. I, I showed you these words and I read them to you. So you had a visual and an auditory memory of it. And I asked you not to guess, but only to write down what you were sure that you heard, you saw, or I wanted you to have a memory of seeing it or of hearing the word. And I hope you followed the instructions. Um, the point was not on the list at all. It has nothing to do with the list, and five of you thought you had it. So that's kind of like the noise in the system that we always expect if you're an experimental scientist. Um, but the real question was taste versus sweet. So as, as you'll notice, taste is on the list, but sweet is the gist of the list, right? Sweet is what m most of the words on the list uh, denote. Candy, sugar, uh, honey, soda, chocolate, cake high. So if your memory was a video recording that fades, then what I would expect is no, you know, very few, five people said point, maybe five people would, um, would say sweet, would say sweet because it wasn't on the list, it's just the noise. And a lot of people would say taste. But if your memory works, as I said, by gist, you would expect um, sweet to be up there with taste, even though it wasn't on the list. And the results were that um, 102 people said taste and 94 people said sweet. So this is an illustration that, that remember next time you're arguing with a friend or a loved one about what you remember, that you can have a very clear memory and still of something and still be wrong. Be skeptical, of, even of yourself. All right, so I hope I've given you a taste of a sweet subject of the unconscious mind. And I, I'm going to end with a quote by someone who uh, generally uh, don't uh, uh, believe in the details of what he said, but, but he certainly was a pioneer in this field, uh, Carl Jung. These subliminal aspects of everything that happens to us 
may seem to play very little part in our daily lives, but they are the almost invisible roots of our conscious thoughts. Thank you. Leonard Landau. Thank you, Leonard. Fantastic. Fabulous.